Boop. Good morning and welcome to day, oh man, I gotta stand over here. I love that we have friends up front. They're not afraid of me. So, we can all see the board and I am excited. This is day five of reading through the book of Acts together. on Monday. That includes our fruit of the spirit, our main character, and our supporting role. Everything we talked about on Monday. Let's pick. Oh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing. I'm going to say, all right. Okay. We talked about love and joy. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about all. Uh, yep. And then we talked about, we talked about this all Monday. Yeah, all Monday. All Monday. And then Barnabas. Not Barnabas, God's chosen instrument is what he prayed they all the way back on Monday. Hey, good thing you ready. Who's that last night? Who's our supporting role? Ananias. Ananias, yes, hey, it's good. Ready, who thinks they got Tuesday? Who thinks they got Tuesday? I know it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a Friday morning, and some of us are like, come away, come away. Jonathan. Um, Bruce here was hope and peace. Um, Barnabas was the encouraging mentor, and Saul was also the he also, yes, he was. Okay, so hope, hope was the main point, but peace and patience were all oh, attributed to hope. Oh, it's okay. Hey, that's why we're here. We're not here to be perfect. We're here to get better together. I know, especially when you hear some people play bass clarinet in the band. Anyway, not pointing out anyone in particular. Day three, day three, what do we have? What were our fruit? What were our, what do you remember on? Um, our fruit was kindness and goodness. Yeah. Silas and Timothy, you got it. And there were three supporting roles. One of them was a wealthy businesswoman from Asia. Yes. I'm going to let someone else answer. Okay, I'm going to try to you got it. Yeah. Lydia, Priscilla, and Aquila. Yes, great job. Lydia, Aquila, and Priscilla. We might talk about them a little bit today and how we talk about what Paul's up to. Yesterday, yesterday, just for the sake of time, think about it, think about it. Our fruit of the Spirit were faithfulness and gentleness. I actually didn't pick any main characters because we dumped, we hung out with Demetrius, we hung out with Apollos, but they didn't really stick with our story, so I put them in the supporting roles category. So maybe now lead roles that were introduced, because we had Paul and any of those people who hung out with him. Especially the people who left Corinth with him as like his guy friends, who was like, dude, I need people around me because I'm going through it. So for today, let's start by saying our verse together. Praesia. Ready, set, go. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with Praesia, so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. Fantastic. This time we're going to talk about receiving mercy and finding grace to help in a time of need. We sometimes need to seek things out. We need to say, Lord, I am putting in all my effort. But today we're going to talk about Submitting to God's control. I asked a couple counselors to help me with this next part. So I'm going to call down Alex, I'm going to call down Candace, and I'm going to call down Andrew. Can you guys come here and help me? We are going to play a song for you, Candace. Yes. Candace, you're going to hold this. Ready? You're going to hold that. That's for you. That's for you because you need to read it to play. Um, Andrew, you're going to sit in this chair, and then uh, Austin, can you hold this? Austin, just hold this. Sit that around your neck. Oh, and then Alex. So great. Ah. <clears throat> anyway, and I'll play this. Ready? Okay, let's play this piece. Let's play this piece together. Ready? Um, set and go. <laughs> Candace, I'm sorry, you're not you're not uh, cutting it. Can you please sit down? There you go. Andrew, there you go. You can have the music and the chair. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Let's try this song together. Let's try it together. And. Um, <laughs> Um, Andrew, you're not doing too well. Sit down, please. Um, here, you sit on there. You sit on there. I'm going to put this here. You're not going to do that, right? There. You do the finger part. I'll do this part. Ready? Okay, ready? There's the music. Ready? You're good. Right there. I think that's your fault. I'm pretty sure it's your fault. Okay, ready? Let's start one more time. Ready? One more time. <gasps> I really appreciate your work. You're such a support. Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. <coughs> anyway, let's see. I know we have more people trying to play this. You know? <laughs> Sometimes, thanks, Josiah. 
Josiah likes it when I make the wrong notes come out. So ready? Instead of having like four people try to do it, this is the instrument that I chose today to play with. And sometimes when we as chosen instruments, we try to have other things control our lives, don't we? Control, determine the behavior or supervise the running of. We often, we often try to take control of things and say, well, I, I want it over here. Lord, this is where I'm putting it. I want you to do what I say. No, 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 Lord, I want it over here. No, I want it back here. And we say, Lord, do, do what I want, but also give me what I want. Sometimes, as God's chosen instruments, we try to set up different people to do different things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't rely on a community. We shouldn't ask our friends for help. I'm saying, what are you doing to make sure God is in control of your life? Allowing God to control your life is the way that you allow self-control to come out of your life. We could try to have four different musicians. Maybe one of our lowercase g gods is Netflix, and we allow that to affect us. Maybe, and this is me, sometimes it's like sugary snacks or food. The counselors and I have been saying the Chay 15 because we know that Rhea loves to eat all the desserts. But I'm being very careful because I told them that, and they're going to yell at me if I do. So, sometimes we let food control our lives. Sometimes we let circumstances control our lives. But what does it look like to let God control our lives? And that is what we will be talking about today. So, looking at our fruit of the Spirit, leading us Romeward bound. My friend Josh Pryor said, is that a typo? And I'm like, no. I'm just really smart because there's this song called Homeward Bound. But I, like, I changed the R to be Rome, because we're going to Rome. So instead of Homeward Bound, it's a Homeward Bound. <laughs> You're welcome. That's comedy genius. There we go. OK, so let's talk about our fruit of the Spirit today. We're going to read it slowly and all together. And we're going to talk about what the rest of the verse says. Ready, set, go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, situation, then we will not be boastful and challenging. We might ask hard questions and be confrontational if it's the way love looks in that situation, but we are not going to serve boastfulness. We are not going to live by saying, hey, look at me. I'm way better. That's not what we're doing. So our fruit of the Spirit, if you haven't guessed it yet, is self-control. And the way that I define it today and the way that I found in my studying is the ability to control one's emotions and desires. Sober, temperate, calm, and having mastered desires, able to marshal and direct our energies. So looking at our map, that's not a map, looking at our map, 
Where are we going to start on our journey to Rome? Where are we starting based on where we left off yesterday? Where are we starting? Where were we? What do you think? You're right. We were in Jerusalem because Paul was captured by the Jews, and then he was beaten up, and the Roman commander came and scooped him out and said, wow, this guy must have done something wrong, and then they're like, let's put him in prison. Right before he was put in prison, he spoke in Greek to the commander, and the commander was like, whoa, if this guy can speak in Greek, he's not just a normal person. He must either be educated or a Roman citizen, which they treat Roman citizens differently than so, let's open our Bibles to Acts 22. That's where we'll be starting today. And we're going to be starting with a defense. That means that he is kind of like defending himself in front of the Jews. So, Acts 22, verse 1 through 21. I'll summarize that for us. So, Paul was standing outside the temple in Shatton, and he spoke to the Jews who, were be or who just finished beating him up. He gave his entire testimony. <laughs> He talked about how he persecuted the church, how he was on the road to Damascus, how the Lord appeared to him, how he went blind, how Ananias prayed for him, and then how he had been persecuted by people preaching the gospel about Christ and his death and his resurrection. So after the commander heard these things, he was like, okay, that's nice. And then the Jews started screaming and saying, kill him, kill him now. And the commander's like, why? He didn't say that he hates you or he's going to kill your families. He said a story about his life. So the Jews, they didn't make sense to this Roman commander because he, they were angry and bitter and jealous. But they didn't have the right to kill him. So the commander actually put him in prison to protect him. Which is crazy when the Romans are protecting this Jewish man from other Jews. I love this because it's so different. So, the commander was like, we got to get the answers out of him. He's obviously lying. So they set him up to get scourged, which means to be whipped because they're going to whip him. And say, tell us the truth. You're obviously not being honest. If these people want you dead, you're most likely a criminal. So they're about to scourge him. And he's like, is it lawful to scourge a Roman citizen who is not condemned? They didn't have the right to say, you're going to prison. You're going to get killed. So... The guy who was about to hit him with the whip is like, shoot. Because what happens if you scourge or beat a Roman citizen who's not condemned, you could be killed. Because you're mistreating your authority that you have. So then the commander walks in and is like, uh, Paul, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul's like, yup. And the commander's like, <coughs> okay, well, sorry about that. Go on your way. But you're still going to have to be a prisoner just because those people want you dead, so we're going to keep you in the prison. And he's like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Isn't this insane? This is the Bible. I know. So then they're like, okay, let's one more trial, one more trial. So they go to the council, which is the Jewish leaders. And they say, okay, Jewish leaders, here's Paul. Ask him questions. Do what you have to. So the high priest is like, well, like, how do you plead? And Paul says, well, I am not. My conscience is clear. I have done nothing wrong. And the high priest says, you liar. And he slaps him in the face, right in the Bible. The high priest slaps him in the face. And Paul's response, chapter 22, verses 27 through 29. Oh, never mind. Skip that one. There we go. If possible, so far. Oh, no, there it is. I'm trying to get off the next. There. Therefore, those who were about to interrogate him immediately backed off. That's the Roman citizen. Oh, did I miss a slide? Oh, that's good. I haven't done that yet. So, the commander set him free. They were about to... Oh, there it is. This is... Lord, help me preach and speak effectively. I'm sorry if I'm prideful. I pray that we have a wonderful time studying your scripture. In your name, amen. I mess up, but I never want to give up on God because God's going to work through that. You have a cool thing. So, like, we think Paul can be really annoyed because he's like, I almost got beat up by my own people because I'm a Rhodesian citizen. What the heck is going on? Romans 12, 9 through 21 are some of my favorite verses. And I think, Alex, this is your whole verse or some of these are. So, this is what it says. If possible, so far as it depends on you, 
Be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay it, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The commander could have gotten in huge trouble. He probably could have died if Paul was beaten. But Paul showed self-control. Saul, Saul, Paul, <laughs> it's a Friday. I love laughing with you guys. Paul showed self-control. Paul didn't freak out. Paul was patient. And Paul allowed the Lord to do what he needed to do through this situation. So then the commander put him in prison and said, hey, let's protect you. They took him to the, the Jewish council. The high priest slaps him. And then Paul's like, dude, God is going to strike you. You whitewashed wall. Do you sit and try according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? So already whitewashed room is pretty much like a curse word. So it's like, ooh. So you don't say that, especially to the high priest who is the highest Jewish governing authority. That's like, that's like going up to your pastor and just like beating the snot out of him and saying, hey, I don't like what you said. No, you would hopefully get in trouble for that. I'm sorry. So, what do you think Paul's response is? Think about it. But those present said, are you insulting God's high priest? And Saul said, I was not aware, brothers, that he is the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Paul messed up. Paul repented of what he did, and he even quoted scripture to say, I am so sorry. I did not mean to disrespect him in that way. Even if Paul was justified in the fact that he said this, Paul made a mistake. How did he make this mistake? Paul's eyesight was actually going, some people speculate, and he didn't notice or recognize it as the high priest. He might not recognize his voice. So Paul made a mistake. Did Paul go, well, you know, like, you yelled at me first. No, Paul was like, I am so sorry. I did not mean to disrespect you. And then we think, man, and now it probably turned out well. Well, no, because then Paul said something about the resurrection of Christ and everyone started screaming. And then the commander had to get him out of there because they were probably going to kill him. So it's like, even in Paul's humility and repentance and that he made a mistake, he said, I'm not going to fight this battle the way I feel like I need to. I'm going to trust God. So then, yet again, people wanted to kill Paul, and the commander was like, okay, we'll, we'll get you to another trial, we'll take care of this. Paul's nephew actually hears that there are some Jews who are going to hijack the caravan as they're going to a trial and kill Paul. So then the commander's like, dude, if they want you dead this bad, and they're treating you like garbage, there must be some truth to what you're saying. So the commander, let's see if I got these number right, numbers right. He got 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. All these guys are like military guys who are really strong. And they escorted Paul out of Jerusalem to a place called Antipatris. So looking at our map, he was escorted from Jerusalem, which is right here to Antipatris, which isn't a big thing. Then he met up with this guy named Felix, and Felix was a governor of Caesarea. He was impressed with Paul and protected him. He was convicted by Paul's message and his truth. And he thought Paul was rich. So he was like, man, this guy's going to pay me a lot of money to get out of prison. So he, <laughs> Paul is not rich. What he actually thought was like, you know how Paul and Barnabas took food and money over during that famine way back, I think that was day two? He heard of that, and he's like, this guy must be rich if he's giving money to people during a famine, you know? So he thought that. Long story short, he listened to Paul. He was like, dude, this is awesome. Please tell me more. And then he's like, also give me more money. But Paul was like, sorry, dude. He actually got succeeded by a guy named Festus. Felix forgot about Paul because he was like, ah, uh, he's not really important. So Felix got kicked out of government. Festus comes in. He was succeeded Felix over in Caesarea, and then he tried Paul and sent, wanted to send him back to Jerusalem because, you know, they love him over in Jerusalem, but 
Not really. Anyway, so he, but Festus showed humility and asked the guy named King Agrippa for help. So what happens is Festus is like, oh, I put Paul on trial and he sounded really cool, but then like people were yelling at him. And it's like, oh my gosh. So King Agrippa's like, I want to listen to Paul. I want to find out what's going on. I will help you figure this out. So King Agrippa's coming in to help Festus. And King Agrippa was in charge of Syria, which is this large portion. It has like Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all these places up the east coast of our map that I'll show you in a second. King Agrippa's like, actually, let's just read this. King Agrippa hears the testimony of Paul and says, in a short time, you are going to persuade me to make a Christian of myself. And Paul responds, I would wish to God that even in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear this day would become such as myself, except for these chains. And isn't that humbling that he's like, I want you to be in the same condition as me. I know you are Roman officials. I know you're wearing beautiful clothing and you're sitting on thrones and people love and respect you. And Paul says, I would rather you be like me be a prisoner than to be in the place you are. And that's hard. And I think that planted the seed and challenged people. It never says that King Agrippa became a Christian. But to be able to speak and live boldly, we can never understand what God is doing. Paul's testimony and character were witnesses to wealthy and powerful people. God used Paul to preach the gospel to the authorities of Rome. Paul was not perfect, but God used his willingness. So, right, we got to move quickly. We got to figure out how this ends. So, Paul was sent from Sidon all the way over here to Mira. Because what happened was, Paul was like, I want to have a trial with Caesar <laughs> in Rome. So, he, they kind of got a little bit lost because they, yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about that. So, Paul appealed to Caesar. He wanted to have a trial with Caesar all the way over in Rome. So, they went over to Mira, and they're like, oh, okay, uh, this is okay. And then they got like a bunch of people on this boat. I think there were 200, 400, no, um, 276 prisoners, prisoners on this boat with him. They go over to Mira, and they're like, okay, they, take, they go on a different boat. They come over to Canidus. They come over to Crete. They go to Fair Havens, and Paul is like, hey, guys, um, much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because the time of season to, to sail in this area was getting very... The waters were getting treacherous. The boat was being tossed. And Paul warned them and said, Hey, guys, the voyage is going to be crazy, and a lot of things are going to be damaged, and we can't even lose our lives. We should stop here. And then they're like, well, we, are, we have money in this boat because it's a grain boat, so we better head out. So they were going to try to go from here, Fair Havens, over to Phoenix, but the wind kind of took them and they got lost. They actually got shipwrecked, or um, they got tempered, or what, what do they call it? Tempest tossed for 14 days and they were lost at sea. At one point, God gave Paul a vision and said, you're going to survive, be an encourager. On this journey, Paul saw these prisoners, these four, or 276 prisoners, and said, guys, be of good spirits, eat food, and then we're going to dump it overboard, and then God will provide and take us to where we have to be. <laughs> Did they have GPS when they were right about here? No. Did they have any clue except for what was in that boat about what civilization was like? No. They got about here, and then there was a shipwreck. And what happened was, there was a Roman commander who said, okay, what we do when there's a shipwreck is you kill everyone on the boat, because you can't have prisoners escaping. A centurion who knew Paul quickly said, everybody jump off and swim. So the prisoner jumped off and swam. And somehow, everybody swam. Every single person survived and made it to Malta. Malta is where Paul and the prisoners meet some natives. And the natives saw that Paul made it safely. Here's where we go. So they saw, the natives saw a creature who grafts itself to Paul. And they noticed it was a snake. Now, they said, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer and threw, because even though he survived the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. 
However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that was, he was about to swell up and suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Fortunately, they didn't sacrifice an ox to him like they did in Lystra, but it was still this thing where it's like, what do you do when someone calls you a god? And I pray that none of us ever have to deal with that. But he just pointed them to Christ. There was a tribe leader named Publius, and he healed their father. People started running to him and getting healed in the name of Jesus, and he would preach the gospel to them as they were happy. Many people were saved. Eventually, the prisoners left. And the, the Maltians, or the natives, gave them food. And they traveled up. And they traveled up. And then Paul finally makes it to Rome so he can have his court. And we're going, And what happened was Paul got there, the prisoners got there, and the Christians invited them, came alongside them and said, rest. I can't believe what you went through. Rest here. The Christians took care of them for seven days, and then they made it to Rome. And then... Not sure who was in charge. I think it was Claudius who was in charge at that time. But he actually set up Paul with a beautiful house. Because Paul was a Roman citizen, he was treated like royalty. He was given a place to live. He was given his own personal guard. And he invited the Jewish leaders and all the people in Rome to his house. And he would preach to them. He would show them hospitality. He was probably a pretty good cook, honestly. If he went through all that and traveled as much as he did, he probably knew how to put on a really good party and preach the gospel in Rome. In the book of Acts, we don't hear about Paul's death. The book of Acts concludes like this. And he stayed two full years in, in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness. Paul spent his whole life leading to this amazing ending. And you think, well, like, what about like him yelling something and then dying and then people like, no. Paul didn't want an epic ending for his life. He was a humble servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, we can read and study about the later parts of Paul's life in the book of Timothy. But I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to ask questions because we got this overview of Paul's life and examples of what it looks like to live with the fruit of the Spirit from us. But this isn't where it ends. You guys can continue studying the Bible and learn more about Paul after change. A couple last things. Oh, a couple last applications. Number one, devote your life to Christ. What can you do to prioritize Christ and relinquish control to God? Number two, develop the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Are you dwelling on the songs that God has given you? As God's chosen instruments, what songs are we producing? What songs from God are we showing others? Number three, direct others to Christ with your life. Encourage others, focus on their needs, and be good listeners. How are you ministering to people? This is a lot of information, but I pray that just the right things are sticking in you, and that if you have questions, you ask them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We pray that it's going to be busy, but I pray that we are all asking questions and focusing on the people who are in charge. May you guide us. May you give us joy. Please give us a burning passion for you. In your name we pray.